Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here on this official unofficial first weekend of the summer. <laughs> that's, 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 when I was growing up, it, basically the summer was bookends. Memorial Day started it, Labor Day finished it. So there you go. So as we uh, proceed this morning, our uh, emphasis is going to be on Memorial Day. And I uh, just want to read some things for you that we do not know one promise these men, these men made, one pledge they gave, one word they spoke, but we do know they summed up and perfected by one supreme act the highest virtues of men and citizens. For love of country, they accepted death and thus resolved all doubts and made immortal their patriotism and their virtue. And this is a quote from James A. Garfield on May the 30th, 1868, at the Arlington National Cemetery. Now, originally called Decoration Day from the early tradition of decorating graves with flowers, wreaths, and flags, Memorial Day is a day for remembrance of those who have died in service to our country. It was first widely observed on May 30, 1868, to commemorate the sacrifices of Civil War soldiers. During that first national commemoration, 5,000 participants helped to decorate the graves of the more than 20,000 Union and Confederate soldiers who were buried there. This is an excerpt from a speech from a soldier who was out there uh, doing the flags out ceremony that's usually done every Thursday before Memorial Day at Arlington National Cemetery. This is part of uh, what his experience. He says, every headstone in Arlington tells a story. These are tales of heroes. I thought as I placed the toe of my combat boot against the white marble. I pulled a miniature American flag out of my assault pack and pushed it three inches into the ground at my heel. I stepped aside to inspect it, making sure it met the standard that we had briefed our troops, vertical and perpendicular to the headstone. Satisfied, I moved to the next headstone to keep up with my soldiers. Having started this row, I had to complete it because one soldier per roll, per, per roll was the rule. Otherwise, different boot sizes might disrupt the perfect symmetry of the headstones and the flags. I planted flag after flag as did the soldiers on the rows around me. Bending over to plant the flags brought me eye level with the lettering on those marble stones. The stories continued with each one. Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart. America's wars marched by, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea, World War II, World War I. Some soldiers died in very old age. Others were teenagers. Crosses, stars of David, crescents, and stars. Every religion, every race, every age, every region of America is represented in those fields of stone. I came upon the gravesite of a Medal of Honor recipient. I paused, came to attention, and saluted. The Medal of Honor is the nation's highest decoration for battlefield valor. By military custom, all soldiers salute Medal of Honor recipients, irrespective of their rank, in life and in death. We have reminded our soldiers of this courtesy. Hundreds of grave sites would receive salutes that afternoon. I planted this hero's flag and kept moving. We finished up our last section and got word over the radio to go place flags in the column barrier where open-air buildings contain thousands of urns. <clears throat> Once we finished in the columbarium, Mission Complete came over the radio, and we began a long walk up Arlington's Hills and back to Fort Myer. In just a few hours, we had placed a flag at every gravesite in the sacred ground, more than 200,000. From President John F. Kennedy to the unknown soldiers to the youngest privates from our oldest wars, every hero of Arlington had a few moments that day with a soldier who, in this simple act of remembrance, delivered a powerful message to the dead and the living alike. You are not forgotten. And I was looking at the uh, statistics, casualties of war from 1775 to 2023. The total casualties are 2,852,901 plus people who have died defending this country. And so let's stand please. We're going to have the playing of taps. And this is from Arlington National Cemetery.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to live in this country. It is a privilege and an honor. And I thank you for those who served and made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could stand here today and to worship in freedom. Those who gave their lives because of their love of country, their patriotism. And I thank you for them. I pray for their families, the ones who are living today, that you would give them comfort and encouragement and peace during this time. And help us to ever be grateful and never to forget the sacrifices that were made on our behalf so that we can live these privileges out and help us to remember. Some people call them rights, but they are more privileges because you give them to us. So thank you. Thank you for those who have served. Thank you for those who served and gave everything in the line of duty. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So remain standing. We're going to sing. Our opening today, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. We're going to sing verse 1 of that song again. This is our call to worship. Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Pray that you would help us to 
participate in spreading the gospel through giving our uh, tithes and offerings. Pray that you would uh, use these monies to support missionaries, those on farm fields, give them the things that they need to spread the gospel each and every day. In Jesus' name. All right, we make standing. We're going to sing, I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> it's in the hymn book, number 606, which you all see the words on the screen. Think about this. As we're talking about the people, Memorial Day, remembering the people who gave their lives for us that we can have the freedom. This also focuses on what Jesus Christ did for us and ask the question, what are we doing for Him to express our love to Him? I gave my life for Thee. Korean War, 
and the Vietnam War that we might be free. Truth is another thing more important than life. Many people have died in the struggle for truth. Peace is another thing more important than life. It seems strange to say that some have to die in war in order for there to be peace. But it's true. We live in peace today because soldiers fought and died to win it. Jesus knew there were things more important than life. In fact, Jesus gave his life that we might have salvation, forgiveness of sins, and peace with God. And Jesus came back to life to prove that he had the power of life and death. We have life through him. Let's live our lives with Jesus each day. And of course, John, Jesus said in John 15, 13, I'll quote the name. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did that for us. We are to love each other as Jesus loved us, and he loved us enough to give his life for us. We may not have to die for someone, but we can also practice sacrificial love in other ways. <coughs> Listening, helping, encouraging, giving. Think of someone who needs this kind of love today and give all the love you can. We must remember that there are some things more important than life. Let's remember and honor the men and women who died for these things so that we can be free and have life here this week. Let's pray. As we remember the men and women who gave their lives to us, to keep us safe this Memorial Day. Also, we thank you for sending your Son Jesus to die for our sins and to give us salvation through his blood. In Jesus' name, amen.
reigns forevermore. We know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, we're going to be with the Lord forever. And He will be reigning. He is reigning. He will be reigning. And we'll be right there with Him. So as we go on with remembering about Memorial Day, I you know this year we, I have uh, been to two funerals, uh, both veterans that have passed away. The first one was at the end of January. My father-in-law, James G. Stoniker, he was, he was basically laid to rest in the Central Texas State Veterans Cemetery outside of Killeen, Texas, outside where Fort Hood is. And then the second person was just this past Tuesday, uh, laid to rest at Target Memorial uh, United Methodist Church, and that was Andy Andrew Burke. And so we were able to be there, part of those, and they both had military honors at their funerals. Now, uh, one of the impressive things is the flag. You know, the flag's draped over the coffin, and then you have uh, two military personnel who come and they fold it. Y'all ever wondered how they do that? A lot of practice, right? Lots of practice. Well, I was curious because you know that there are 13 folds that they make. And so the first fold, basically this flag folding ceremony represents the same religious principles on which our great country was founded. So these are what the folds mean. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second, a symbol of our belief in eternal life. The third, made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks who gave a portion of his or her life for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature. As American citizens trusting in God, it is him we turn to in times of peace, as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold, a tribute to our country. In the words of Stephen Decatur, our country in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is still our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The seventh fold, a tribute to our armed forces, for it's through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The eighth fold, a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day to honor our mother, for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood. It has been through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that has molded the character of the men and women who have made this country great. The tenth fold, a tribute to fathers, who has also given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since he or she was first born. The eleventh fold represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The thirteenth and last fold, when the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, in God we trust. Now, you know, then the flag, they tuck it in, and they basically, it has the appearance of a cocked hat, which means reminding us of the soldiers who fought under General George Washington and the sailors and marines who served under, <coughs> excuse me, Captain John Paul Jones and were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the U.S. Armed Forces. And then the source and date of the origin of the, this flag folding procedure, some say it was the Gold Star Mothers of America during World War II. Others think an Air Force chaplain stationed at the United States Air Force Academy who basically started this. And also some indicate that the 13 poles also have a, a, a reference to the 13 original colonies. Now, at the end of that ceremony, what happens? That flag is presented. And these are the words that are said. Now, I'm going to use the two uh, branches of the military that were represented. My father-in-law, father the United States Navy, and then Andrew, Andy Burke, was the United States Air Force. So these are the words that are said. On behalf of the President of the United States and the United States Navy, the United States Air Force, and the grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. And that's what is said when the flag is presented to the person uh, that has been designated in the family to receive that flag. I bet y'all didn't know that, did you? 
I always wondered about those folds. I said, I know, sure, they're representing something. But we have, why do we have Memorial Day? What is the word memorial? What does that signify? What's the meaning of memorial? In memory of, to remember, right? Huh? What? How many of y'all had trouble remembering things? You know, that's tough. You know, and so God, you know, he put things into perspective because when he created man, he knew that eventually people would have trouble remembering. I mean, how many of y'all can't even remember what you ate yesterday for breakfast? Much less something that happened a week ago or two weeks ago. It's, it's tough. But we remember these things. We need to remember. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, first memorial that God set up. He said, this is God in conversation with Moses. God says, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. That's what Moses is supposed to be telling the people. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. God's name was the first memorial. Remember who sent you. Well, as you remember, Moses asked, All right, when I go to these people and tell them these things, who do I say sent me? Or on whose authority? What did God say? Tell them that I am who I am sent you. That's who you should say. Now, God set up different memorials. If you read through the book of Leviticus, also in Exodus and uh, Numbers, even into Deuteronomy, he had different feasts and festivals. Basically, they had Passover. What's Passover represent? Yes, death angel, blood on the door, passing over those who had the blood to remind them of that situation. And then you had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Basically, this serves as a reminder to live in the righteousness and in God's provision. First fruits, talking about the harvest season in Israel. Basically, you offered the first fruits, the first part of the harvest to God as a sign of gratitude and trust for His provision. The Feast of Weeks talked about the completion of the wheat harvest. And basically it was a thanksgiving to God type for the end of the harvest. The Feast of Trumpets. That's Rosh Hashon. Basically it's a reflection on repentance and preparation for the Day of Atonement. Because the Day of Atonement is coming the next day. The Day of Atonement is a time of fasting, prayer, repentance. Focusing on seeking forgiveness for sins and reconciliation with God. And the Feast of Tabernacles. Basically, they live in these small tabernacles or little lean-tos, basically. And it's to remember the Israelites' journey through the wilderness after leaving Egypt. And these are all memorials to remember what God has done for them. And so, the feast, the purposes of all these feasts, you remember what God's done for you. Worship and thanksgiving to the God who took care of you. Spiritual lessons you would teach your kids. But why are we living in this lean-to? Why are we living in this grass, you know, this temporary shelter? Well, this is why. To celebrate God leading us through the wilderness. And the agriculture and, observ and seasonal observances, God's provision and His sustenance, to remember that. Also, it taught community and unity. The feast provided opportunities. You could exchange blessings, hospitality, acts of kindness toward each other. And then prophetic significance. Because it was pointing toward future events and the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Uh, think of this. For instance, Jesus' death and resurrection coincide, coincided with what feast? What was that week that Jesus went to Jerusalem? What? Why did he go there? What was going on? Passover. Yeah, Passover. And so, this would coincide with Passover emphasizing the ultimate deliverance from sin and death. Through his sacrifice. Remember Passover, the sacrifice, the lamb with the blood on the door, top, bottom, and sides, and reminding them of the chief sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Remember John chapter 15. We read that in the verse we're focusing on. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. And these are the words of Jesus Christ because he was giving them the foreshadowing this is what's going to happen. As I'm going to lay my life down for my friends. Going to give it up. And not just for my friends, but this was for salvation 
for the entire world, paying the penalty for sin, so that people who trust me completely as my as Lord and Savior, they will have forgiveness of sins, but they'll also have eternal life and salvation through Him. Now, some of the things that we remember from Memorial Day, Pearl Harbor. Now, that one, remember Pearl Harbor? That was the, that was the same. Uh, December 7, 1941, at 07.57, Lieutenant Commander Logan Ramsey sent out this historic panic message. Air raid, Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. The Japanese had started their attack at 0755 and he sent out this message two minutes later. Remember Pearl Harbor, World War II slogan. To honor the bravery, the courage of those who were, who were there, who died, and help keep Americans focused on the war effort. And so it's relevant now to remember the lives lost then as well as the global events leading to that day. And you remember in this war message, President <clears throat> Franklin D. Roosevelt, he described this incident as a date that will live in infamy. And we remember World Pearl Harbor because it was a pivotal moment in modern history. Basically, how America responded.